Warlick. Um, good morning, everyone. My name is David Warlick, um, and uh, I have been invited to uh, be one of the keynote speakers at this conference. Uh, of course, you're all sitting in a variety of places in your homes, in your offices, in your uh, your uh, living rooms, out on the beach. Uh, I don't know where, and it doesn't really uh, matter. I'm sitting here in my uh, in my office, looking out on a sort of a uh, uh, cloudy day, but uh, at least it's not getting up to 102 degrees here. Uh, in fact, I think it's not going to get above 85 degrees here in uh, in Raleigh, which we're very very happy about. Um, I, what I'd like to do today is, is very different from anything that I've done before, and, and basically I'm just going to go back to my southern heritage and uh, and just tell you some stories. Uh, and it, this is this is you know one big story in a sense, uh, and, and that come, it's going to come in ten parts. And and these are just instances from my experience as an educator. And and these are these are experiences that have uh, sort of been focal points uh, for me professionally and philosophically in terms of of um, discovering uh, the the potentials of technology in education. Of course, I was using technology in education when I was uh, when I first started teaching, and and this was before the desktop computer. This was before the the personal computer. In fact, uh, I looked it up a, a while back uh, when I became a history teacher. Calculator still cost two hundred dollars. And what's really funny is that they were advertised. I found an advertisement where it says, this is the gift for a lifetime. Uh, and, and this is part of the theme of uh, what I'm going to start off talking about today. And, and part of the theme that has colored a lot of my philosophy in education and, and the, uh, you know, the driving points of education today. Uh, uh, some of you are familiar with, some of you may even uh, subscribe to a magazine called Wired. Um, uh, I became infatuated with the magazine when it was first uh, published uh, in 1993. Uh, I don't have the first or the second edition. Editions, which I understand go for a large amount of money on eBay, but I did start subscribing at the third edition, and I believe I have them all uh, since then. Uh, but but just recently, Wired published its first edition uh, on an iPad version, and and I believe that it's free, uh, uh, even for those who are subscribing. So if you get if you download the iPad uh, player on um, uh, for Wired, then that's one of the issues that you can download for free. And what's fascinating, and I'm going to go on to my next slide because this is part one, tripping the light, fantastic. Um, What's really fun about looking at old Wired magazines, and I'm going to I'm going to drag over an, uh, a photo of the uh, the initial the initial issue, and it should show up on your screens in just a few minutes. But what's what's fascinating about going through old Wired magazines is looking at the advertisements and 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 looking at what was being sold at that time and how it was being sold and. Uh, Got another picture. This is a picture that I took out of that initial um, uh, issue, and uh, what you're looking at, or what you're going to be seeing in the next few seconds, is a GPS device that was sold by Sony. Now, uh, the the device cost about twelve hundred dollars, and it connected to four satellites. This is all explained in the advertisement, and uh, and it admits that if you're lost, it might not get you found, but you're always going to know where you are, in, at least in relation to the equator and the prime meridian. <laughs> and and this thing was being sold for uh, twelve hundred dollars at that time. This is nineteen ninety three. Now, I've you know I've I've taken GPSs for granted for a number of years now, uh, and it was only a couple of weeks ago that I downloaded a Garmin uh, app for my iPhone that uh, behaves and operates exactly like the Garmin uh, uh, GPS that I carry around with me when I'm traveling, and it costs 99 cents. Now, when back in 1993, when I was looking at this advertisement, and I was being, I was amazed at the potentials, at the possibilities of, of, of uh, global positioning systems. This seemed fantastic. It was fantastic, and that's why you look at Wired magazines and similar magazines, and 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 many technology blogs. We look at them so we can see the fantastic. Yet, it was only a few years before this was something that we took for granted. And I think one of the one of the uh, most interesting things about being an educator today, and one of the things that we have to realize as educators, as a society that is defining education in this day and time, is that we're preparing our children for the fantastic. 
we are preparing them for the fantastic, for a time when what we now believe to be fantastic and imaginable, uh, uh, just way out there, is uh, the world, the experience, the learning that they're going to be taking for granted uh, in their future. So, you know, one of the, again, one of the driving questions I think that, that we have to be asking as educators is, is what do children need to be learning? How do they need to be learning it in order to be ready for the fantastic? For me, I'm going to go on to the next slide. This is part two, first contact. For me, it all began with technology back in 1981 or 82. I'm not absolutely sure which, but it was when I saw my first uh, desktop computer. Now, um, I was familiar with computers. My dad was fascinated by computers when, when I was coming up, and he used to take me to his workplace where he would show me these big room-sized uh, computers that could, uh, uh, at amazing speeds, you know, within about five minutes, uh, sort uh, holler at uh, uh, um, oh, the, the uh, stamp cards, the punch cards. It could arrange those in alphabetical order in about five minutes. I mean, he, he was just blown away by this sort of thing. So, so I had some familiarity with what computers were, but I had no idea what a personal computer would be. You know, I've been seeing these Radio Shack uh, uh, computers in the magazines, in their catalogs, uh, but I had no idea, you know, what would you do with a personal computer? So I happened to be taking a class at the time, uh, a recertification class in uh, prescriptive reading and writing. And uh, the, the professor's uh, name was Dr. Thunderbird. And this was at Wingate College down uh, outside of Monroe, North Carolina, where I was living at the time. And uh, for one of the class sessions, he took us to his learning lab. He had established a learning lab uh, there in Monroe where parents would bring their children in, and he would do all sorts of diagnostics as to why they weren't making the grades that the parents thought that they should be making and, and, and prescribe different programs for them. Uh, and so he took us on a tour of his lab, and, and the first thing that I saw when we walked in was a Radio Shack Model 1 computer. In fact, I think I've got a picture of one of those for the, those youngsters out there that are totally unfamiliar with this. Uh, you should see appearing on your screen to the right a Radio Shack Model 1 computer. Now, now, you know, my interest was, was peaked. You know, when here's this computer, I'm going to see this computer. How's he using this as an educator? How's he using this for diagnostic prescriptive reading and writing? Uh, so he takes us on the tour. He takes us around to the different rooms and he shows the different programs, uh, uh, and, and not computer programs, but the different, different, uh, instruments that he has. And, uh, and then we come back to the main room where I'd seen the computer and he dismisses us. And I, you know, raise my hand, Dr. Thunderbrook, uh, tell, tell us about that computer. How are you using that computer? And he looked back and he said, oh, I am so glad that you asked me about that. I'd completely forgotten. Uh, so he took us back to this Radio Shack Model 1 computer and he sat me down at it. Now, again, I had no idea what you're going to do with this. I had no idea what I was going to see on that screen. I, mean, I figured you'd just see, you know, lights start flashing on the screen, you know, in binary code or, or something like that. And um, he reached over uh, underneath the keyboard. He, he flipped the switch. It came on. And up in the upper left-hand corner of the screen, it said, ready. And I fell out of my seat. You know, this, this was a machine that was talking to me. It's a machine that was telling me it was ready. Now, I got back up on my seat. He reached over my shoulder. He typed in a bunch of stuff. He typed in uh, uh, C load uh, math probe. Uh, something to that effect. C load meant load off of cassette because they, they didn't have disks back then. Didn't have, certainly didn't have hard disks on com, uh, personal computers. And you can see the uh, uh, the cassette drive over there. So he had a program on a cassette that he was loading. It took about uh, three and a half minutes for the program to load into the computer. But uh, but when it finished, it put a, a list of options on the screen. And at the top, it said press the letter of the math problem you want to run. Now, not only was this computer communicating with me, but it was actually telling me how to operate it. It was telling me to press the letter that represents that's the side of the type of problem that I want. And he pointed out, this is called a menu. This is a, a list of options of things that you could do. So, I, so I, I scanned down, and I pressed D for long division. 
I wanted to try a long division problem, see what happened. So I put a long division problem up on the screen for me, and I, I worked through it. I typed in the numbers, and it put the numbers up on the screen in the correct place. I uh, finally got to the correct answer, and the screen went blank. And for about 90 seconds or so, pixel by pixel, it made a picture of a smiling face, indicating that I'd gotten the correct answer. So, you know, I'm blown away, and this, this, is, this is absolutely amazing. And, 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 and I started another long division problem, and this time I answered it incorrectly, and the screen went blank, and for about 90 seconds, pixel by pixel, it made a picture of a frowning face. And this was even more exciting than the, than the smiling face. And, and, you know, I was just, I was totally blown away. I'd never seen anything like this before. I had not imagined anything like this before. And what I realized on that day, and I couldn't have told you this at the time. I taught history, and I couldn't have told you this at the time, but I taught history from the perspective of technology, you know, that we invented the bow and arrow, and it affected culture in these ways. Uh, we invented agriculture, and it affected culture in these ways. And I saw this as one of those technologies that is going to have a profound effect on, on our culture, because what, what I was looking at was a machine that you operate by, by communicating with the machine. You operate the machine by communicating with the machine through a language. And, and I would suggest that part of being a connected educator today is being able to connect to the machine, being able to operate that machine by communicating with the machine. Now, um, I, I came back to school, and I was all excited, and I talked to the principal about it, and, and he got kind of excited. And uh, uh, the next year, during the summer, somebody at the central office, I don't know who, but somebody at the central office had written a grant uh, to get some computers into our schools, and, and uh, it was uh, uh, in particular two middle schools within the district. And the middle school I was working in got one of those sets of, of uh, computers. Now these were these were Radio Shack. Let me draw draw another uh, picture in. These were Radio Shack Model Three computers. Now these computers had two floppy disk drives, 16 kilobytes of memory. These things were hot. And, 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 you know, my school got 11 of them. And since none of the other teachers in my school had any interest in them at all, I got all 11 of those computers into my classroom. In 1982, I had an 11-unit computer lab in my classroom. The only problem was that there was no software. You know, the grant did not include software because back then we believed that, that uh, you know, just the, the, the green glow off of those cathode ray tubes washing over our children's faces would make them smarter. Uh, and we just we didn't know about software yet. That wasn't part of the, the, the uh, computer literacy courses at the time. So uh, I set about teaching myself how to program, which was uh, an enormous learning experience for me, uh, and, and for lots of reasons, not the least of which, I finally had a reason for all of that algebra that I'd taken when I was in high school and, and, and college. Uh, and and what, was, what was most powerful, and I probably couldn't have uh, – described this at the time, but what was so powerful about it was that I was learning math by doing the math. Now, I wasn't just learning math and working problems, but, but I was using math to work numbers, you know, to make the computer work the numbers that made the computer behave the way that I needed it to. And it seems, it seems, it seems now like, a, like a, a, an enormously powerful way to learn mathematics is, is learning it by actually working, using it to work the numbers. Uh, anyway, I, I started writing some software, writing some uh, educational games for my students. And one of the first games that I wrote was a game called Stock Baron. Now, this was a, it was a stock market simulation that the students could run. They could run it for a six-month period. Uh, they would go up to the computer. They would start the program. They'd load and run the program. And it would start off with uh, uh, an online, not online, but a digital newsletter called the Wall Street Review. And this would, uh, this would feature three stories that I had written. I'd coded all this stuff in. So there were three contrived stories that I had put into the, uh, into the program. And each of the stories was designed to have either a positive or a negative effect on one of the ten companies that the, that the stock barons, the players, had an option to buy stock in. And they started out with $100,000, they believe, dollars. So they would read the first issue. 
of uh, Wall Street Review decide which companies, from the stories that they got, decide which companies they should invest in, where they should buy stock in, which companies they shouldn't or sell stock in, and then they go to the next month and they see how much money they made or how much money they lost, and they get another issue of uh, Wall Street Review. So they enjoyed it. Uh, it had, uh, you know, it was uh, about inference. It was about uh, uh, logic. It was about social studies. It was about mathematics. Um, and, and it also became about something else. When after about a week and a half, a group of, of boys who called themselves the stock barons, they all had, had first period study hall. So they would, they would, you know, leave study hall first period and they would all come into my classroom and they'd play stock baron. And, uh, and after about a week and a half, uh, these kids started making millions and millions and millions of dollars in one six week period. And I couldn't figure out half because I would get on it after school and I would play it. And the most I could make was about a half a million. And, you know, and I knew the codes. I wrote the program. I should be getting the perfect score. But these kids are making millions and millions of dollars. So I asked them, you know, how are you doing this? How are you making all this money? And they said, oh, Mr. Warlick, it's just shrewd business finance knowledge. We know how to do this. You don't. And this went on for about, for about uh, two weeks or so. Until so finally one of the boys waited until after school waited until the halls were clear, came into my classroom and said, Mr. Warlock, I need, to, I need to explain to you how we're doing this. He said, we found a bug in your program. I taught him what a bug was. And he said, we found a bug in your program. He said, we learned that, that under these conditions, you can sell more stock than you own. So I took one of the computers home with me that night, and I worked on the code. I worked on the programming of it a bit. And I brought the computer back in, and uh, before the kids came in, I loaded the program on all the other computers. And uh, so first, first period, uh, stock barons come marching in. And one particular boy, Pearson Duval, now he was the king of the stock barons. And Pearson Duval comes strutting into the classroom, and he goes to his favorite computer, and he sits down, and he starts playing the game. And I'm watching Pearson Duval. I'm lecturing history stuff, and I'm watching Pearson Duval out of the corner of my eye because I don't like Pearson Duval. And I'm watching him out of the corner of my eye. And, and that, that, that constant look of cockiness on his face very slowly but, but certainly turns into concern. And then it turns into downright worry. And he finally, my computer just went blank. That is not good. We still see you. We can still hear you, and we're still seeing the slides. Sorry. All right, just a moment. Okay, how's that? Am I back? Still good on our end. Okay, thank you. And, and I apologize. Uh, we had the same problem last time we did a, an interview, and I should have gone in and double-checked it. But uh, we'll, I'll, I'll just keep moving the mouse around, and maybe that'll, that'll keep it from happening. And I kind of forget where I was. Oh, Pearson Duvall, he's working on this, this program, and he's getting downright worried. And Pearson Duvall, he finally, hesitantly, raises his hand and says, Mr. Warlick, what does embezzlement mean? And, and why did I just get fined $2 million? And, and, and I will never forget the look on Pearson Duvall's face when I got him. You know, I got him. I had trapped him. I had recoded this program in order to, to teach him something. And I will never forget that for that reason, but for another reason. And the other reason is that I realized on that day that the power of this machine was not so much that it's a machine that you operate by communicating with it. The real power of it is that this is a machine through which we can communicate with each other in powerful new ways by, by constructing, using it like Legos, using it to construct learning experiences for our students. You know, I mean, it was, it was a, the first analogy that, that came to mind as I started teaching myself to program is that this is like playing with Legos, except you have a, a limitless number of parts and a limitless number of ways that you can put these commands together, that you can put these concepts together to make these experiences. And, and I would suggest that the connected educator needs to be someone who can connect with the machine, but also needs to be someone who can connect, uh, 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 connect with learners through the machine. So it's not just about connecting with the machine and operating the machine, but it's about using this machine to construct experiences through which we can connect to learners in very powerful experiential ways. 
part three of this story, constructing an experience, and I feel like I've gotten a little bit ahead here, but uh, not so much. A number of years later, uh, I had I had moved from that middle school. I'd moved up to a, a school district in, in the northern part of North Carolina as a director of technology. And uh, we had Apple Apple II computers, Apple IIe computers uh, in the school district. And, and I want to tell you a story uh, about a librarian friend of mine, librarian at the school. Her, her name is uh, Cynthia Wilson. I, I think she's retired now, but I'm not absolutely sure. But Cynthia Wilson was one of these librarians who took the technology. I mean, she, she instinctively understood how, how computers and ultimately the Internet and modems and things like that uh, plugged into how, how a library operates, how you can use this technology to enhance uh, your library. Now, Cynthia had a group of seventh grade students that came into her library. And these, these, were, ki these were kids who, who today we would call at-risk uh, kids. We didn't have that term back then. But these were, these were kids who you couldn't get to write their name. Uh, on the paper in the classroom that were reluctant learners, reluctant students for a variety of reasons. Well, she had these students in her library, and they were talking about writing. And she said, she asked, do you think you could write a children's book? And they all said, we looked at each other and said, sure, I mean, that'd be easy. We could write a children's book, no problem. So she uh, she took them over to she had seven uh, radio shack excuse me seven Apple IIe computers and she took them over to these computers and uh, uh, she taught them how to use the word processor and they were, we were using something back then called Fred Writer which was a uh, uh, a free word processing program that had been developed by Al Rogers in California. And it was freely available. People made copies of it and shared them with each other. So she had a bunch of copies of this. Uh, she booted it up. She showed them how to use the word processor. And they set about to writing uh, their children's stories, their children's books. Uh, when they finished, it took about a week working on this, coming in, into the library every day. And um, when, when they were finished, she told them, well, and she may have told them this up front. She said, you know, I like what you're doing. I think what I'm going to do when you finish is I'm going to email. We were using something called Fredmail back then, which was also developed by Al Rogers out of California. Uh, and, and she said, I'm going to email your stories to the elementary school down the street so that some first graders there, I've got a first grade teacher friend there, and the first graders there are going to be able to read your stories. So the seventh graders got excited that there was going to be an audience. There was going to be a, they were going to have a readership for their writing. So they finished the stories. Uh, she uh, emailed each of the stories to her first grade teacher friend, and uh, the teacher then printed out the stories and stapled them together and then handed them out to uh, first graders. Now, the first graders then read the books. But they read the books with crayons in their hands. They illustrated the books as they were reading them. Um, this went on for a couple of weeks, and then they made arrangements for the first graders to walk up the street to the middle school with their books printed out, illustrated books. They walked into the library in the middle school where the seventh graders were all sitting behind tables ready to do a book, uh, a book signing. And these first graders were so excited to meet the authors of their books. And the thing is, the seventh graders were even more excited to be, to be meeting people who were so excited to meet them because of what they had achieved. And this is a whole other kind of connection. Uh, it is a connection by constructing experience, but it's also a connection. I may be getting ahead of here again, but it's also a, a, a connection through accomplishment. It is a connection through Learners who are empowered not just to learn and answer questions and not just to achieve a score, but they are empowered to accomplish something with what they were learning. And when we can accomplish something and we can share that something, then we can make connections not only with the teacher, but we can make connections with each other. We can make connections with the world. It's another way that educators can be connected. Now, we're going to move on. Now, that was probably 1988. We're going to move on to 1990, uh, where I had uh, recently joined the uh, State Department of Education, North Carolina Department of Public Instruction. Uh, so I'd moved to Raleigh, and, um, um, and I was, you know, doing a lot of the same things that I was doing as a director of technology, and, and of course, again, it's just at a, more of a state level. And um, one, of my, uh, uh, one of my colleagues, had been given a login for the internet. 
now I, I had been emailing in and out of the internet for a while through Fredmail, but I'd never actually connected to the internet. I'd never actually done the internet. And we had this login through a university now that I could connect to the internet. She didn't have any, you know, any real interest in it, so she gave me the login. And, um, and I, you know, I learned how to do this. I learned how to use things like Telnet, and uh, in fact, that was that was probably the only thing she used back then was uh, this this program called Telnet that you would use to log in to a computer, and you you could surf around on the internet. Now, now of course, it wasn't surfing around on the internet like it is today. You weren't you weren't pointing and clicking your way around. You were typing in these secret incantations, and it was like the old DOS uh, operating system. You typing in these incantations that would take you to different places. You could download files and and and, and read stuff. Um, and and one day I got an email message. It was part of a mailing list. It was a public email message. Lots of people got copies of it. It was talking about a new service on the internet called IRC. Now IRC stands for Internet Relay Chat. And essentially, it is it is a service through which you can go in and you can communicate with other people who are connected to that service at the same time. So you can communicate in real time with other people, not just read files and download files, but you can actually communicate people in real time, not email. So um, I, I went home that night, and uh, and I started up the uh, uh, telnet, and and the the. Email had announced that this service was available at North Carolina State University, which was there in Raleigh, right down the road from where I lived. So um, I connected to this service. Uh, I logged in, and uh, it gave me a list of letters, uh, A, B, C, D. And each of those letters represented, um, you know, today we might call it a channel. Back then it was called a chat room. And so you could enter a chat room and there would be people chatting in there. I chose D because D already had uh, four people in it. And I didn't want to, you know, I wanted to lurk. I, want, I, I wasn't ready to start chatting. I wanted to kind of experience and see how this worked before, uh, before I started participating. So I chose D because it had four people. They were already talking. And uh, uh, I went into this room. And, and I start seeing these messages scrolling down the screen, these four people talking to each other. And I very quickly realized that they were computer science students. Um, and, and from their, from their conversation. And they were talking about an exam that they had just taken. And they were not being at all polite <laughs> about their conversation, uh, of this exam. And they continued talking. It was a computer science exam. They continued talking. And, uh, and I, I finally got comfortable enough, confident enough, that I broke in and, and I introduced myself. I told them who I was, what I did, you know, for a living. And they very politely faked an interest in what I did for a living. But, uh, I asked them, what do you think a fifth grader could do with this level of access to the internet? Well, there was a long cyber pause. Because, because in 1990, nobody was thinking about fifth graders on the Internet. It was still the domain of universities and research centers and the, and, and the military. Um, nobody was thinking about you know, school children on the Internet. But finally somebody said, well, you know, you can, you can go over to this place over here and you can download this information. And then somebody said, you know, you could go over to this site, this server, and you could finger uh, uh, a, uh, a downloading of the latest earthquakes, earthquakes that have happened around the world, longitudinal, latitudinal positions. And then somebody said, we well, could go over here and you can download a list of the, uh, uh, of the upcoming shuttle flights and the manifests on the shuttle flights. And, and they started getting really excited. You can tell when computer nerds are getting excited because the spelling proves. <laughs> and, 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 you know, they, they, they kept getting more and more excited until somebody finally said, well, you know, this is really neat. There's all kinds of possibilities. Let's get together and talk about this, you know, in real life, RL, in real life. And I said, great, you know, where, where are you going? And they gave me the name of the pizza joint, which I, I didn't recognize because I only recently moved to Raleigh. So I asked them for the address, thinking it was one of those places across Hillsborough Street from the campus. And they, uh, they gave me the address, didn't recognize that either. And I said, well, where are you guys anyway? And somebody typed in Reykjavik, Iceland. And I typed, I've got to take a rain check, which is the name of this story. I've got to take a rain check because, you know, I'm in Raleigh in the USA and I can't make it. And I had no idea that y'all weren't here in Raleigh. And, you know, we continued to talk a little bit more, and, and then uh, uh, they started logging off, and I logged off. I thanked them all for the conversation, telling them how, how much I enjoyed it. 
And then uh, I logged off and I walked away patting myself on the shoulder. This was amazing. I mean, I had been, I had been talking people from another country for free. And I went back to work and I was telling people, you know, I was talking to all these people for free, how neat this was, how this is the future. And, and, and it was, it took about week, two weeks for me to realize that the power of that experience was not that I was talking to these people for free. The power of it, the message behind this was that, that I spent about 40 minutes talking to these people before I realized that they weren't at stake, before I realized that I was talking to people in Iceland. You know, for 40 minutes, it didn't matter that we were, were a quarter of a planet apart from each other. It didn't matter that we had different, different native languages, that we came from different cultures. You know, that we were connecting. We were connecting through, through ideas. We were connecting through proximity, but it was not a proximity to each other on the planet, but it was a proximity to technology. It was a proximity to the computer and the internet and the skills to use that computer and the internet in order to, to, to connect with each other. So, so I would suggest that, that the, the connected educator uh, must be able to connect through space, you know, regardless of geography, even regardless of time, but also be able to connect through ideas. And I'm probably going to uh, uh, hammer more on that one uh, in, in just a few minutes. So uh, we're going to move on just a, a little bit further. This would be uh, about 1992 or so. And this is before the World Wide Web. And the name of this story is Going Down the Rabbit Hole. Now, at this time, this was, you know, was Apple II computers. There, there were video games. There had been video games for a number of, uh, of years. But the earliest video games didn't look anything like the video games we have today. They were, they were called adventure games. And, and since computers, it was very difficult for computers to do really any kind of graphics at that time, it was all text-based. So you would start this, you'd put your disc in, you'd start this game, and you would, uh, uh, you would read a description of where you are. It would say you are in a wood paneled room, there's a desk in front of you, there's a door to the left, there's a door to the right, uh, there are three door drawers in the desk. And then you could type in little two and three word commands to, to interact with that text-based environment. So you could go left, which would take you into another room, and you'd read a description of that room, or you could go right, or you could look desk and see what's on the desk, or you could open drawer, and it would tell you what's in the drawer, and then you could interact with those objects. Now, I had never really done any of this. It didn't really uh, interest me, and video games still don't interest me uh, that much. But then I discovered uh, something called MUDs. Now, MUD stands for um, uh, multi-user domain, or sometimes called multi-user dungeons and dragons. Uh, essentially, it was the same thing. It was a text-based game, but it was on the Internet. It was a server out there on the Internet, and uh, you could be playing this game, but other people could be playing the same game with you. So part of the description of this environment would be, and in the corner is standing Pi O Pa, uh, standing tall in the description of Pi O Pa. And I may be Pi O Pa, and I have described myself so that when other people encounter me, they read the description that I've written about myself. And I could be, you know, anything. I could be any height. I could be any color. I could be, you know, from any century, for that matter. And, uh, uh, and, and, and so it, it started out as games, and, and it continued as games, but a, a, a lot of people, educators in particular, started seeing some potential in, in treating this less as a game and more as a sandbox, you know, where, where uh, it becomes a place where, where the activity is not in playing a game, but it's in building the environment and building the environment bigger and richer. Um, I participated in, in a project out of, uh, uh, out of MIT, uh, the Media Lab, called uh, Media Moo, I think. Uh, and there were a number of these things. There was, uh, uh, there was MUD, multi-user domain. There was uh, Muse, multi-user simulated environment. Uh, Mush was one of my favorites, multi-user simulated hallucination. Uh, Moo was probably the most powerful. And, and if uh, you know, any of you are familiar with Tapped In, uh, a, a staff development service uh, that operates in this way with a text-based environment, uh, they operate, I believe, using a Moo, multi-user object-oriented is what it stands for. Um, 
So, so uh, I had fun with this. The the local newspaper, uh, Raleigh News and Observer, actually had a a, a uh, uh, mud server, and uh, and I got to know the guy who was running it, and uh, and got a, a, a personality. I was I became a person there, uh, and I built a couple of things. I built a museum called the the Museum of Imagination, and it was a, a, a it was the museum itself, and then there were display rooms, exhibit rooms, and each exhibit room had a different thing. And it was one from the history of newspapers. But what, what I encouraged, or a few, few kids who were coming in, and what I encouraged them to do was to walk into a room where there was a, a bin. And, and of course, this is still all text based. You're reading about this bin with generic exhibits in it. Well, the, the student could then, the kid could then, or anybody could, could pick up a generic, a generic exhibit and then redescribe that generic exhibit as whatever they wanted to contribute to the museum. You know, so if they're in the if they're in the hall of agriculture, then they could they could uh, uh, you know they could contribute an old time plow, uh, but they had to be able to name it and they had to be able to describe it. And the richness of that description depended on the richness. Excuse me, the richness of the object depended on the richness of the description. And the richness of the description came from the the research that the student, the, the kid, had to do on this object, and also their ability to write it uh, very descriptively. So this is a lot of fun. And I was very, this is one of the most exciting things that I've seen I, I, to this day on the internet is is, is that it's a, a constructive a, a constructivist approach to uh, teaching and learning, but it's also a language approach. You're doing it all with language. You're doing it all with text. You're doing it all with sentences and, and, and communication. Uh, there was a, a particular project that I, that I developed a lot of interest in and some relationships with uh, called Miramuse. Uh, and Miramuse was a, a group of educators at Maricopa College down in Phoenix, Arizona, I believe. And the, the leader was a woman by the name of Billy Hughes. Uh, and Billy uh, had set one of these up. She and her staff had set up one of these environments, and uh, they they had they had set up a, a world, and they were doing a lot of experimenting with it. But they they got to thinking, you know, what what would be the the possibilities of school children coming in and having one of these to play in, to build in, uh, to learn in. So they made arrangements with one of the uh, uh, principals of one of the middle schools, and uh, during the summer, and I, I don't know, this is ninety two or 93, during the summer, they had something called uh, 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 Mara Camp, Mara Muse Camp. I can't remember exactly what it was called, but it was Mary for Maricopa and Muse. And uh, they, they had kids come in who were at risk. These were kids who had, uh, uh, I don't think they had necessarily failed, but they were, you know, very poor students. And some of them had, a couple of them had actually been expelled uh, during the year. And um, uh, they invited them to, to, to come in. And, and the, their world, their, their uh, uh, virtual world was essentially flat asphalt when they first came in. And they were they were taught how to use it, and and they were you know they said things like uh, on the first day you know the the teachers heard whispering from the students saying this is so dumb, you know, this is so dumb I don't understand. But by the end of the first day, the teacher said that that the kids all agreed that this was the coolest thing that they had ever seen because they were building with ideas, they were building with text. Uh, there was one particular girl, uh, her online name was Genji, and, uh, or Genji. Uh, and Genji actually went home and uh, convinced, bribed her older sister to take her to the library so she could research caves, because she'd always wanted to live in a cave. And she wanted to build by describing a cave in this, this virtual environment. And she wanted to be right. She wanted to be good. She wanted to be uh, uh, the rich sort of place that her friends would want to come uh, and, and visit her in. Uh, so they, they, um, you know, they built their homes. They visited each other's homes. And they started building a town. So they, they had lots of conversations about uh, municipal concerns. They, they had to set up some rules, some laws on how they would, they would have to behave. And, uh, uh, there, there was one particular boy, I can't remember his name, there was one particular boy who, uh, who had been expelled during the year, uh, and he was a tough kid, he was a rough kid, and all the other kids were afraid of him. They, they didn't talk to him, they wouldn't talk to him, he didn't talk to them, he kind of stood, stayed off uh, to himself. But he um, secretly fell in love <laughs> with, with, with this experience, with this activity, and he became uh, very skilled at it, and he became the person who in this world the, the, the other kids would come to to ask questions and say, how did you do this? How do you do that? 
And, and for, for a period of time, they didn't know that the person that they were talking to was this kid that they wouldn't have anything to do with in the real world. But he became very important to them. And uh, I'm sorry, but I just uh, blinked out again. I, I apologize. Okay. All right. Um, I'll try to keep that from happening again. But, uh, but you know, the power was that this boy was able to experiment uh, with alternative ways of interacting with other people in a way that he probably couldn't in real life. But, but through this text environment, he was able to, to experiment with different ways and discover himself that he had value, that he had things to share, that he had the skills to share with these people. And as they started realizing who this really was, then, then that friendship, that sharing, this conversation started existing outside of, of the virtual world. Uh, the, uh, I remember I attended their graduation at the end of the summer camp. And, uh, and of course, as, as uh, Pai Pa was my name, and, uh, uh, and I attended. And uh, you know, a lot of the parents were there as well. Of course, the parents weren't, weren't in the virtual world. They were in the actual real world. But they were talking about how um, you know, many of them, the only reason that they'd ever come to school before was because their child was in trouble. You know, they'd never been invited to school uh, in order to see things that their children had accomplished, things that were that were that were impressive. They'd never seen that happen before. Um, and and one of the teachers, uh, one of the one of the, the moments that she remembered the most was uh, was when you know at the end of the, the first couple of days when the students looked up at her and said, "You don't think I'm stupid, do you?" You know, she she was having a learning activity that she was uh, that she was successful in, and she suddenly realized that her teacher, who was there, wasn't, wasn't considering her stupid, like was you know, which which was her experience. And and uh, when it was all over, uh, the kids when the when school started the next year, the kids helped uh, these teachers write a grant. Uh, to bring in nine uh, computers into the school and nine phone lines. This is back when you had to have phone lines in order to connect to the internet. So they brought in five, nine phone lines, got the funding to do that through the grant that the kids helped them helped them to write. Uh, now I had an office at uh, at MIT at the time, a virtual office uh, that was part of. Um, Micromuse, I think it was called, but I'm not absolutely sure. Uh, and I invited uh, the teachers and the volunteers over uh, for an interview. And I have that uh, interview. I published it on the Internet. And I'm, I'm just going to paste in, if I can find it, I'm going to paste in uh, a hyperlink so that y'all can um, – Y'all can read that at your leisure. It's 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 actually very moving, uh, reading some of the comments that the teachers had. So I'm going to paste in uh, a URL for that, so y'all can go visit that at your uh, convenience. So you know this was a this was a connection. This is where where educators the the connected educator connects learners to each other through their accomplishments. You know, the learners are learning by connecting not just with the teacher and with the textbook and the, and the chalkboard, but they are connecting with each other. And they're connecting through accomplishment. They're connecting through uh, their success. They're connecting through trying to achieve the success with help from each other, which is a, which is a, a powerful form of learning. Uh, the next story I call Wishing on a, on a Fading Star. Um, after I left the Department of Education, Department of Public Instruction, uh, I uh, connected with a friend who was connected uh, to a group up in New York called Advanced Network Services. Now, Advanced Network Services was run by um, a man by the name of Al Weiss, Alan Weiss. Uh, Alan Weiss uh, um, had a great story. He was not a successful student. He dropped out of high school. Uh, he dropped out as a failure, dropped out feeling like a failure. But he got into the world of, of computers, and uh, he, he discovered his own value, discovered his own strengths through this world of computer, and he eventually became the vice president at IBM. Um, but he, he then left IBM, formed, uh, founded Advanced Network Services, and they created uh, one of the, uh, the important parts of the infrastructure of the Internet back then. I don't know the details, but uh, you know, what they built, they eventually sold to America Online for lots of millions of dollars. Um, and this was, this was the beginning of the World Wide Web. This is 95, 96, 97. 
Um, and and uh, the World Wide Web was just beginning to be discovered in education. In fact, one of the things that I did for them was uh, to go around uh, and and do workshops with teachers all, I, all over the East Coast. Um, and and I had the the, the privilege uh, and the thrill of introducing lots of teachers to the World Wide Web who had never seen the World Wide Web and the Internet uh, before. Uh, and that was just that was a real high point for for me personally uh, was having that thrill. But um, uh, Al Weiss, you know, the, the, the World Wide Web is new. It's just now starting to eke into uh, schools, and there was, uh, there was almost no educational content on the World Wide Web. And Al Weiss had, had the feeling, uh, the opinion, that perhaps the best people to create educational content were people who are being educated, the kids who are growing up playing video games who are familiar with this, that maybe perhaps they are the most qualified to start creating educational content. So they started a project called ThinkQuest. And, and at ThinkQuest, they, uh, uh, the students worked in teams, um, and they uh, created websites that were designed to help other students learn something. Uh, there were there were different themes, there were different categories that they could work in. But one of the things that I thought was uh, was was most powerful and and informed me in a lot of my thinking was the evaluation. This was a competition, uh, and and uh, Advanced Network Services uh, gave away over a million dollars in scholarships every year to the teams who created the best uh, uh, the best websites. And the the criteria for the judgment was not just the educational value of the website that the students created, but it was also the degree of collaboration, uh, the challenge of collaboration. For instance, if uh, if, the, if the students are in different cities. You know, then they get extra points for that, that level of collaboration. If they uh, are in different countries, they get more points. If they speak different languages, they get more points. Uh, one of the teams had a had a, a a player in Russia who spoke no English, a player in uh, a team member in Maryland who spoke no Russian, but there was a team member in Alaska who spoke both languages. And and so they were challenged uh, to break through some of these barriers, and they saw this as being a powerful thing because when you're challenged uh, to be Resourceful, then you could perhaps come up with better ideas. Uh, so, so you know, being one of the the consultants and one of the trainers for the project, I got to go to the uh, award events, which were big galas that they had in in uh, Washington or, or Los Angeles and other places. Um, oh, uh, another uh, another. Uh, criteria for the competition that I thought was very powerful was that the more people who visited your site, the more points you got. So the sites actually went live as part of the evaluation, as part of the competition. And so you're, you're, you're challenged by your collaboration boundaries. You're also, um, uh, you're also creating valuable content, but you're also creating content that is going to draw the attention of other learners, of other students. So it's got to be something that's going to be, you know, not just fun, but something that's going to be engaging, that's going to draw their attention. So you had these different and other uh, criteria. I remember, I remember one particular team uh, uh, as I was at the uh, awards gala uh, during one afternoon during the gala weekend. Uh, the students each, uh, the teams each got a high-speed computer, a you know, state-of-the-art computer, uh, high-speed access to the internet. Um, perhaps a T1 line. I don't know what it was uh, back in uh, uh, 1996, but one of the teams. Uh, toward the end of the, the afternoon, I was walking around and I was having conversations with different teams. Toward the end of the afternoon, I looked back in the corner and there was a, there was a single boy sitting back there at their station. The other two boys had already left and left him there to uh, answer any questions that, that came in. So I walked over and, uh, you know, they had a big sign above their display, Middle Ages. So I walked over there, you know, I taught history. So, you know, I'm not going to talk Middle Ages. I'm going to talk history to this kid. I'm going to impress this kid. And uh, Walter, well, we started talking about the, the Middle Ages, and, and he proceeded to, you know, knock my socks off, you know, because it wasn't just the historic events, but what they had concentrated on was the nuances of the lifestyle. How did they have fun? How did they, you know, how did, how did their families run? How did they, um, you know, how did they relax? How did they work? And it's just the nuances of the lifestyle of people who lived during the Middle Ages in, uh, in Europe. Um, and, and, you know, I finally interrupted the boy, and I said, you know, where did you learn all of this? 
and he said, from college professors. And I, and I asked, how old are you? He said, 14. Well, how did you learn this from college professors? They said, you know, when I had a question, something I needed to learn, I'd get on the Internet, and I would find a college course, you know, that probably taught this thing. And uh, there was always the email address of the professor of the course. So he would email a question to uh, the professor, you know, uh, so that he could learn what he needed to know. Now, he, he, then, he, he then said, you know, I never told him I was 14 years old. He said, I always told him I was a graduate student. And, and uh, uh, that, that type of resourcefulness, that type of, of you know, uh, innovation, thinking through, of, of really understanding the nature of this environment and how we communicate and how people operate. And what, 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 he was, what he was tapping into is what Alan uh, November calls the grammar of the Internet, the grammar of how the Internet uh, operates. And he understood this, and he was able to utilize this understanding in order to help himself learn things that would have been difficult to, uh, 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 to learn otherwise. Well, you know, I've, I've talked a little bit more with him, and I finally walked away crestfallen. And one of his teachers uh, called up with me, tapped me on the shoulder, and said, she said, Mr. Warwick, you need to understand that the boy you were just talking to is not a successful student. He has been at risk of failing. She said he has blossomed as a result of, of, of ThinkQuest, of this activity, because, because we and he has discovered that he has skills, that he has knowledge. And, and perhaps the biggest surprise is, is the leadership that he exhibited that nobody had ever seen before. And, and the experience of, of participating in this ThinkQuest team, uh, the, the power of it was that he had access to content. Uh, but, but perhaps even more important than that is, is what I was saying before, that he had an understanding of how this worked and was able to utilize this. He was empowered. Uh, he was empowered. And as a result of that, he became confident in his knowledge. Um, uh, I, I, the, the next year, I remember I was having dinner with one of the teams, and they had an astronomy uh, site that they had created. And they got to talking about how there was, there was this uh, um, comet that had just gone through. And they got to talking about how uh, um, this was probably the last time we'd be able to see this comet because it was very difficult to see it because of light pollution, because there is so much of the world is casting off light in the nighttime now that that light bounces around in the atmosphere, and uh, we just can't see the skies the way that we used to could. And I think many of you will, will, will agree with this. Uh, so this may be the last time that we see it. And, and, and one of the, the boys said, but you know, if you think about it, as the world is becoming increasingly connected, as we are becoming, uh, have new ways of communicating with each other, communicating with lots of people, it could be that by the next time this comet comes through, we could agree, you know, as a hemisphere, that on this certain day, at a certain time, we're all going to switch our lights off so we can all go outside and we can all enjoy uh, this comet. Now, now, it just blew me away. It just blew me away that he had come up with this idea, this suggestion, just out of the blue. He had come up with this. But again, it points to uh, uh, you know, not the content that he had learned, but how well he understood this environment, how well he understood uh, uh, as a result of communicating with his friends and communicating with other people who provided them with answers to questions, that, that and as this grows, if it grows, then you know, some of these things that we, we lament, we may actually be able to solve, and we may be able to solve very, very easily. Connected educator learns through uh, learners' creations. Uh, connected educator helps students learn by connecting them through their creations. Uh, this is not a story nearly as much, and I'm, I'm going to have to skip one of my stories here, I, I, I know, but uh, this is not a story nearly so much as, as it's just a realization uh, that I made. When I taught myself to, to program uh, to, uh, in basic programming, uh, I had to get a book. I had a book. You know, I had to read this book when I started teaching myself uh, uh, HTML. Uh, I didn't need a book. 
because there were these files that people had written uh, out there uh, on the internet uh, tutorials on making HTML. You know, so they were the people were publishing on the internet, uh, whereas you know it was probably months before any books appeared in the library or in the bookstore about how to do HTML. Whereas almost immediately there were uh, there were documents out there that you could download, that you could read that would help you do this. But but. What I do today, and the, the way I learn today, I've, I've, I've been spending a lot of the last couple of weeks working on some uh, uh, on, on class blog, not class blog but uh, citation machines, some new features in citation machine, and I've been using a um, uh, a, a framework called jQuery, and I've known about it for a long time, uh, but I've not been able to really make it work for me. Uh, until uh, until this time, but of course, you know, as is often the case, you know, you do it the way the instructions t tell you to, and it still doesn't work. What's what's wonderful about today's information environment is that it is likely that it d hasn't worked for other people, and so other people have posed the question out there on the internet. You know, this is what I've done. This is what hasn't worked, and uh, can anybody help me? Well, you know, down beneath that is an answer. Uh, from somebody who has solved that problem, and they answer it. And and you know what's what's powerful that's going on here. What j just impresses me almost every single day is that I am uh, eavesdropping on conversations. That people are having conversations out there about what's working, what's not working. Those who don't know are connecting to people who do know, and they're having these conversations. And those conversations are being uh, are being archived, and they become available to me so that I can I can type in some a search phrase related to what I'm trying to do, and I find these conversations that have happened out there about this thing. And I'm learning from mistakes that people have made. I'm learning from solutions that people have come up with. And uh, and and you know. I think the most powerful thing, and there are other stories that I could I could use to demonstrate this, but but the network that I learn through is not a network of wires; it's a network of ideas. I connect to people through ideas, not through wires, but I connect them because I have a question, and 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 there's an idea behind that question, and I connect to other people who have answers, and there's an idea behind their answer, and the network is a network of ideas, and I think that's something that that it's part of being literate today, but it's also part of being a connected educator today. Is 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 how to how to cultivate uh, networks that that are connected together by ideas, not just wires, but by ideas. Um, at another story that I actually tell a lot, so I'm going to I'm going to skip it uh, here uh, about pyramids, and I'm going to go on to my final story, part ten, a story of disconnect. Uh, and this is a story that I'm not told before, uh, that I've wanted to, but I, I just haven't found the the opportunity, and it fits in here. Uh, and this this goes back again to when I was with the State Department of Education, State Department of Public Instruction. And uh, our, uh, one of our assistant superintendents, associate superintendent, had just attended a, qual a quality management workshop. I think that's what's called quality management. It's uh, uh, um, Denning. Uh, I can't remember his first name, but Denning was the person who, who came up with this. And he attended this workshop, and he was so impressed by it that he wanted all of his employees, all of the people in his his uh, department, uh, in curriculum and instruction, to to attend it. So uh, paid a bunch of money, hired these consultants to come in and teach. And uh, uh, and it was you know, it was a room of about 150 people uh, who were attending this workshop about uh, about quality management, and it was you know, it was a good workshop. But 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 what struck me, what stuck with me, what I remember was the day that the the leader of the the consulting firm, the leader of the workshop, asked us, and we're all instructional uh, instructional uh, services folks, uh, asked us, who do you work for? And the students. We work for the students. No. Who do you work for? Uh, we work for the families. No. Who do you work for? We work for the communities. No. We work for the future. No. Who do you work for? Well, we just couldn't get the right answer to that. And she finally said, the answer is you work for the legislature. And I immediately realized she was absolutely right. You know, we had all taken these jobs because we were good educators and because we wanted to share. We had knowledge, we had experience, we had ideas, uh, we had things to share. We wanted we wanted to enrich the classrooms in North Carolina, to enrich the learning experiences of the students in, in my state. Uh, but she said, "You work for the legislature. Our job was not to work for those kids. Our job was to implement a, a policy from uh, the elected uh, body in my state." And and 
you know, I realized on that day that my days were numbered at the Department of Public Instruction. That that just that that isn't what I wanted to spend my time doing was implementing the policies of people who were uh, not educators, if anything, were amateur educators. Um, and and the reason that I tell that story is to is to remind you that there are interests out there who don't want you to connect. There are interests out there who who for whom the empowerment that happens to you and your learners by being connected to the world that they're learning about, that power comes at a cost. It comes at a cost of the power that these interests out there uh, have, a, have a vested interest in. That, that they now hold. It is, uh, it is government, it is, uh, social interests, it is political interests. And, and I think that this is, this is one of the, the, the barriers to connection that needs to be part of our ongoing conversation. And it is a part of our ongoing conversation. It is, is how do we, uh, how do we wrestle this connection and the power of that connection from those who have traditionally, uh, held that power? Some of them will adapt. Some of them will learn how to share that power and how to be a part of that and how to be a partner in that. Some of them are going to hold on and they're, they're going to crumble. It's not a new story. You know, this has happened in other industries, uh, music and, and, and so on. But in education, it's a struggle that we're going to have to take. And this really needs to be part of, uh, of our ongoing conversation is how do we, uh, how do we break through the limits that have been, uh, put in place and held in place by those who are seeking to hold on to that power. 20th century education is defined by its limits. 20th century education was defined by the limits of the classroom, the limits of the, the covers of the textbook, the limits of the bell schedule. 21st century education must be defined by its lack of limits. Thank you all very much for listening to my stories, and I hope you have a wonderful rest of the conference. David, thank you so much. I'm going to discourage Q&A at this point because we have two other sessions that are starting. But uh, I'm clapping for you. And I apologize, but it came out perfectly. No, you were perfect. I'm sorry. <laughs> perfect timing. Uh, the, the timing came out perfectly. <laughs> nice job. Thank you so much, David. Have a great day. Thank you. Bye-bye. Yes, brilliant.